The battle of Britain is about to begin. Welcome back to the Lead Pursuit Podcast. Tonight, we're going to talk about the thatch weave, or is it the beam defense? Or is it, ah, I don't care what you call it. We're going to talk tactics. Thankfully, it's not just me talking tactics. Tonight, I've got Steve on the podcast to offer his opinion. Steve, how you doing? Good, man. Just trying to coast into Christmas break. Oh, I know. I know, man. I, I, I think I'm coasting, but I'm not really sure. People keep sending me emails while I'm supposed to be coasting. <laughs> it's not working. Also, we have Brett on board. Brett, how you doing tonight? I'm good. I've been on vacation so far all week. And we I'm don't care. Currently sober, <laughs> so I'm doing good. <laughs> well, that's no fun if you're on vacation and sober. I'm not drunk yet. My Victory Point Sour Monkey is first beer of many. Probably should have pre-flighted before this one. So thanks for joining me, guys. Really appreciate it. Uh, it's going to be a good discussion tonight. But first, I'm going to get on my soapbox, and and I need to rant a little bit here. And you know, I want to take a moment and address a real problem that we have both in the ready room and we actually have it throughout wargaming, you know, today in this era of the internet. Lots of people around the world have stated that we live in a post-truth society where you simply repeat unresearched conclusions in enough forums and with enough force that it really becomes, in a sense, the new truth. We've seen this several times and and that's really unfortunate. Um, tonight I'm going to put the who in it, not because I'm trying to be a jerk, but to try to make a point that this is just not how you do history. In this latest iteration, Ken Nat postulated, and I'll quote, quote, I just wonder if this is one of those wartime stories that gets inflated in public opinion slash perception due to the circumstances at the time, which let us be honest, were dire. And then he goes even further in a later post and says, quote, I understand the theory. It just looks very suspect, end quote. Well, here's the problem. So Ken wonders out loud without presenting any evidence. And even when the maneuver is explained, offers the comment with two mutually exclusive halves. Ken, buddy, if you truly understood the theory of the tactic, it would not look, quote, very suspect. And that's something we've got to be really careful of. As amateur historians, we owe it to our community to not just think off the top of our heads and then go looking for evidence to support whatever our random thought is. That is how bias is directly incorporated into historical revisionism. And we as a community end up actually drawing the wrong lessons and furthering biased perceptions. Now, on the other hand, if up front you took the accounts of one of the detractors of the thatch weave, Oh, by the way, do you know who any of those are? I do, and we'll talk about them tonight. And if you'd explored their reasoning, or even if you took a single historical account of where the weave failed, and those accounts are out there, if you look. I mean, heck, you can find out by just even going to Wikipedia. You don't have to go that far. If you found one of those accounts, then that's a piece of information that you can build a thesis around. To put the thesis before the historical information is little more than having a hunch about something that you've not researched, then going hunting for information to reinforce that bias theorizing. We just can't do that. So we're going to talk about the theory and practice of the thatch weave. Rant complete. Oof, that, that was, uh, that was kind of tough, Doug. Sounds like you're a little passionate about the subject. I, I'm just wondering after I hear all that is, is the thatch weave like actually used in like combat training today? You're getting ahead of yourself. <laughs> I just have to know, man. Inquiring, so, <laughs> nine, inquiring minds got to know. Back in your box, we're going to talk first about the weave itself. But to talk about the weave itself, we got to talk about who's this thatch guy and, and what the heck did he do and why does he have a weave named after him? And what is a thatch weave? Yeah, you know, this actually, um, 
I'm curious about this, Doug, because, you know, I've said numerous times, the listeners know I'm a big fan of History Light. So my knowledge of the Thatch Weave comes from the critically acclaimed Academy Award winning television show, History Channel, Dog Fights. So I'm hoping you can give me something. That's a place to start. I I often make fun of dog fights when when we've talked about it a couple times the the way it depicts maneuvers may not be right or it may be you know super cinematic uh but it, it actually is a really good show to dissect some of the actions and how things were done and what the perceptions were so it's better than a diagram off wikipedia how about so, Bob, Bob black sheep that's where i'm coming from I, okay that was terrible <laughs> i love that show that's terrible <laughs> which there's another side note there that that we we take so much of our perceptions of air combat from cinema and that when cinema shows us things that look really, really, really cool, but are really, really, really impossible to happen in a dogfight, we just don't, don't even know where to separate Hollywood from the truth unless you go dig into the accounts. And here's the thing, and we'll talk about it a little bit. One of the difficulties of digging into the accounts is when you do that, you have to really listen to the, the descriptions of the maneuvers and you almost have to plot it out like like Thatch did and make sure that it all works. So so let's talk about Lieutenant Commander Jimmy Thatch. So who is this guy? Well, in case you didn't know, he had six kills in the Pacific. He's an ace. Uh, was the CO of Fighting 3, VF3 in 1940. Uh, he focused his squadron heavily on aerial gunnery. And unlike a lot of other squadrons where they were concerned about formation flying, they were concerned about a lot of the other things they could be judged on. He concentrated so much on gunnery, half of his squadron pilots got an E rating for gunnery. And that's actually notable because most other squadrons were 10 to 25%. So it means that these guys, maybe they couldn't join up in formation or maybe their long range navigation wasn't the best, but they understood gunnery. And we'll talk in a bit about how gunnery was trained to, because that's critical to understanding the weave. It's critical to understanding- What is an E rating? So there- E ratings are the highest rating you get in the Navy for personal or ship qualifications. Have you ever seen a ship that has certain uh, ribbons painted on it that then have a, a big gold E painted on them? That's a battle E. That's for being rated to the highest level of your efficiency. Uh, you could also get that for personal efficiencies. If you hit the top scoring bracket, you got an E rating for whatever it was and whatever the, the squadron or individual evaluation. So as a pilot, you were evaluated on gunnery. You were evaluated on dive bombing if you were in a, a, uh, a scout or bombing squadron. Uh, you could have an E rating in those. Uh, there's a great story by one of the people we'll talk about later, one of the detractors, uh, where he talks about his first squadron CO, who was an E rating in both aerial gunnery and in dive bombing, and literally went out and showed everybody else in the air wing how it was done when he was refreshing in the SPD Dauntless. So, you know, that's when it's not a small. Uh, feet for half of a squadron to have that E rating. And that actually worked against them a little bit later uh, after Pearl Harbor. So basically before Pearl Harbor in, in, you know, mid to late September, 1941, a report comes out on the 22nd of September. And that is a, a fleet air tactical unit bulletin. It's kind of funny. They still have the same thing today that comes out. It just has a changed name, but it's a, it's, it's a bulletin that puts out what's been seen around the world Uh, Nowadays, it's classified. I have no idea if in the 1940s it was classified or not, but it says we've seen this country's Air Force do this or, you know, this country, the Chinese, when they fly their version of the Su-27, here's how fast they go. So so this is a standard naval product. He, He reads these intel reports and it's directly evaluations of the zero versus the flying tigers, the AVG. Uh, and it and it's talking about the maneuverability of the zero and how the AVG was beating the zero. So he then takes a look at this and he starts kind of creating this tactic that is initially, he calls it the beam defense. And it's a way to, to force the zeros to make a decision. Do I want to shoot somebody or do I want to get shot at? You know, and, and we'll talk why that works a little bit later when we get to, to actually to the Battle of Midway. So uh, problem is Thatch and his guys are really successful. They're really good. And they, and they start training to this Thatch weave Battle of Coral Sea happens. A bunch of pilots have already been attrited, and VF3's 
pilots, their, their experienced pilots, literally get gutted and sent off to be replacements. So congratulations, Jimmy Thatch. Thanks for building the best gunnery squadron in the Pacific Fleet. We're going to take all your pilots and you're going to start over again. So in his mind, the thatch weave is even more important now because all of his good gunners are gone. And so he has to take somebody who's very inexperienced, keep them alive and give them an opportunity to shoot a zero off his tail. So let's go fast forward to the Battle of Midway. Uh, VF3, Fighting 3, is now in the USS Yorktown during the Battle of Midway. Uh, 16 of their 27, so over half their pilots, were replacement augments from VF42, from Fighting 42. So literally, they've got half new guys who have not even trained with them. And that'll be a funny side note here in a little bit. Uh, He actually goes out on a combat air patrol, or sorry, not a combat air patrol, on an escort mission, uh, taking the uh, the SPDs and the Devastators on the strike against the, the Japanese carriers, uh, and he gets bounced. His sixth ship of, uh, of Wildcats gets bounced by, wait for it, over 15 zero. Some accounts say upwards of 20. I'll just say 15. Heck, if you said 12, that'd be a lot of zeros. <laughs> Cue the meme. How many zeros is too many? Oh, never mind. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So, Stephen Brett, you guys now have a have an image of like 15 zeros swarming six wildcats, right? Yeah, I mean, it's I'm, like, I'm following It's like it. right out of the movies. I'm digging it. I mean, there's like three zeros on every wildcat, right? Okay. That sounds yeah, no, it's kinda... not that way at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that way at all. So so we got to back up and say, how do you train to aerial gunnery? Well, you tow a banner behind another airplane. Well, doesn't that mean you're going to shoot down the airplane towing the banner? <laughs> well, quick physics lesson. To keep from doing that, you had the banner towing aircraft fly in a circle. And you would, in single ship formation, you'd come off of what they called the perch. You'd pitch over, you'd do a quick diving attack your bullets would be incapable of hitting the airplane towing the banner most of the time. And you would shoot the banner and they'd evaluate, you know, how, uh, um, how well you'd done uh, by the color of bullet paint that was, that was still embedded in the banner. So long story short, air forces around the world trained to making gun attacks by single aircraft. They trained to coming in from above and pitching over off the perch and making a slashing attack at another fighter that doesn't see them. Well, the other problem is just pure physical space. If you got, you know, three zeros all trying to chase one, one wildcat, you got the scene out of Top Gun. What did what did uh, what did Ice and Mav say in that scene? Oh come on, someone remember? Oh man, that. was it? Uh, you know, I'm in in ten seconds, Mav. Break left or something like that, right? <laughs> exactly. So you owe the beer for making the uh, the Top Gun quote. Not well, me. I'm guessing. Yeah, if, exactly. if you had multiple pursuers on a single target, wouldn't they almost collide as they converge at the? Yeah, they they can't all occupy the same point in space that you have to be at to shoot that airplane. So so literally, they're going to be supporting each other. And and because I like primary sources, uh, I'm going to read a quote from Saburo Sakai. Yes, in case you might know who that Japanese ace is. Uh, he gave some very specific direction to his wingman when they were executing a long-range uh, air-to-air raid uh, at the around Guadalcanal. Um, he says, quote, They're going to have us at a distinct advantage because of the distance we have to fly. I want you both to exercise the greatest caution in every move you make. Because remember, they flew in three ships. One lead, two wingmen. Above all, never break away from me. No matter what happens, no matter what goes on around us, stick as close to my plane as you can. Remember that. Don't break away. So literally three zeros would be stuck there with one dude trying to shoot and the others just kind of watching him and making sure nobody rolled in on him. So you don't have three zeros really attacking you. You have one zero attacking being watched by their two wingmen. Now, how does this, how does this play out in the first engagement? We kind of laugh because in, in Blood Red Skies, we want the Thatch Weave to defeat that initial shot, right? You know, keep me alive. Uh, Brett, I know that was the discussion you and I had, had, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know we were first talking about, like, if we were working on a card mechanic to represent this in a game, maybe it should have some defensive as well as offensive action. Yeah, so so what happens the first time it's executed in combat? Thatch looks out, sees that there's a zero about to shoot his number four, who then breaks into him because... His number four knows the thatch weave tactic, knows that that turn into into Jimmy Thatch is going to initiate the weave. 
Thatch turns into him, and number four immediately gets shot down. <laughs> so guess what? On day one, the first execution, a guy got shot down. Well, obviously, because it's it's tough to defeat that initial shot, but you but you have to defeat that initial shot. And then the rest of it is is this weave we talk about. So number four gets shot down, unfortunately. Um, the, the zeros then, as soon as the weave starts, they immediately peel off because they see Thatch and the rest of the flight starting to turn towards them. Remember what I said about Thatch's squadron being more than half replacements? So half the guys didn't know the play. Think about this as going down range in a football game. They've never executed it. They don't know the call for it. Literally, the ensign that is on uh, Thatch's wing sees him break back into his wing and goes, where's he going? What is he doing? And ends up following him around, not knowing what he should do to execute the Thatch weave. And so literally he's irate for the entire flight until they get back. Thatch has now shot down three zeros, unfortunately lost one wildcat, but they get back, they land and, and Thatch explains it to him. He's like, Oh, that's great. That's, that's brilliant. Why, why didn't you tell me? Sorry, you're the new guy. You just joined the team. We didn't read you in. Uh, so it's interesting, but you know, thankfully he sticks on Thatch's wing. And so the remaining number three, Ensign McComber there in number two, basically keep the, the weave going and the other two aircraft um, do a little bit of the weave, but they also get bounced by zeros as they're trying to defend uh, the SPDs and the uh, <clears throat> and the Devastators. So it's a it's an interesting first roll out of the weave. Not crazy super successful, but in its later on execution gives Thatch the ability to shoot down a couple zeros after losing his first wingman. You know, the other thing that is really surprising is it's often... Uh, I mean, real history, people know it, right? But the Zero was like a technological marvel of an aircraft at the beginning of the war, right? Like, it's just hard to, to when you think of the later war planes and how kind of dominant the Allied Air Forces were, the Zero was like the biggest, baddest thing in the sky. Oh, yeah. And so that's why it's critical that when, the, during the Battle of Midway, a Zero crash lands in the Aleutians, and we quickly go up, recover that aircraft, fly it or take it back down to San Diego and start flying it. It literally, if you think about it, it's the start of the U.S. Navy's aggressor program and aggressor adversary, however you want to, whichever term you want to use. Jello, the uh, the fighter uh, pilot podcast guy would correct me and would say uh, they're adversaries, not aggressors. Um, but uh, the it literally is the the inception of that where they start taking this zero, they repair it, they fly it against other wildcats, and then they start putting Navy pilots in it to say, hey, you're, you're a squadron commander, you're a training officer, go fly this zero and, uh, and see how it performs. So obviously it, it raises the level of appreciation of the enemy's uh, capability out there. So and for everybody out there who didn't know that, if you would have watched the super accurate historical documentary Airstrike starring Bruce Willis, you would know how amazing the Zero was. <laughs> See, you know, once again, Hollywood to the rescue. All right, well, let's move on. Let's talk a little bit about some other times the, the weave was used by uh, Naval Air Forces. Uh, when the Battle of Guadalcanal happens, and in the lead up to that battle, the, the Battle of the Santa Cruz Islands, uh, Navy squadrons have adopted the, the thatch weave because some of the people that flew in Midway and in VF-3 are now there uh, on some of the other squadrons. The Marine squadrons that are actually on Guadalcanal adopt the weave and use that with varying results. I'm not going to say every time they went out and did the weave, they all survived, uh, but it also took a very underpowered, less capable, less maneuverable airplane and allowed it to not get absolutely savaged by the Zero. And and why do I put any credence in this? So I, I really don't care about the U.S. reactions to it. And I, and I don't care about U.S. primary sources because what I've seen traditionally is people will throw shade at those individuals as if they are biased, even if they re recant, recount exactly what happened in that engagement. But I want to take firsthand accounts of what the Japanese said about it. And I think that is, is probably more telling than anything an American would say about it. So there's a couple different guys. There's three of them. Yoshi Oshiga, 
Saburo Sakai, and uh, Tadashi Nakajima. If these names ring a bell, which they should, they are strike leads, flight leads, carrier air group leads throughout the the air war against the United States. Uh, Shiga was at Pearl Harbor. Uh, Nakajima is actually in charge of a lot of the stuff in the Santa Cruz Islands. Uh, Sakai, we all know about. <laughs> this is actually one of his last events with Sakai uh, for a while when he gets wounded. But Sakai in his book Samurai um, talks a little bit about the weave, but I think he talks more importantly about the way that Americans fought as a whole. You know, so um, one of the the problems the Zeros had specifically in Sakai's mission where he gets wounded uh, is that the Wildcats for once have the positional advantage. Uh, and for once they are now diving in to attack the Zeros who are executing this long range raid. Uh, but even when you do that in a not very high performance Wildcat, the fight is going to turn against you. And as soon as the fight starts to turn against them, what do the, the two ships and four ships of Wildcats do? They start weaving. <laughs> so they realize, okay, we've lost the advantage. We are now, in a sense, neutral or disadvantaged against these zeros. They will eat our lunch if we fight them in a turning fight. Let's start the weave. Let's use our wingmen to defend us. And then failing that, we'll you know, scatter and, and dive. So uh, as Sakai said at one point, he goes, their evasive tactics were puzzling for nothing had been gained by either side. Apparently, the Americans were not going to pick any fights. Well, the point was, after they'd already dove and made their slashing attack, they knew their best chance was to weave, exit the area, and go away because they could not stay in a turning fight with a zero. So that that's one little bit of, of direct quote from Sakai. And another one um, is Sakai relating what happened to Nakajima. So uh, Nakajima, for the first time as the, as the air lead, uh, he sees, he, he encounters fighters doing the weave. Um, and he actually, just like Sakai, just like the rest of the flights was jumped by the wildcats, but then he immediately gets on one of their tails. And what do they do? They immediately go into a weave. And as Nakajima is chasing this one Grumman, trying to shoot him down immediately, the other Grumman comes in and starts shooting at him. So the, the quote is Nakajima was raging when he got back to Rabul. He'd been forced to dive and run for safety. <laughs> so the weave was so effective that he just said, I've got to get out of there because every time I turn in on a wildcat, there's another wildcat shooting me. So I take that as from some very skilled, very, uh, very capable zero pilots flying, as you said, a super capable airplane. The weave worked against them. Did they shoot down wildcats? Absolutely. The weave kept them from shooting every wildcat down out of the sky. What do you guys think about that? Those, as I'm listening to those accounts, I'm thinking about its representation potentially on the game, in the game, and uh, sometimes it just it it seems like maybe there is not the necessity for it to be both defensive and offensive if you were to try to like make a new doctrine or you know come up with some mechanic to represent it because it does sound very defensive mostly. Am I way off base? Well, no, and I, and I think we'll talk about that a little in this next segment. It it was a, a way to transition from what could be a position of disadvantage to a position of neutrality, if that makes sense. It was, it was very much a way to say, okay, I've come in offensive. I have now become defensive. Let me find a way to survive. Because if I stay defensive as a wildcat against a zero... I will die. It it literally is a matter of time. Yeah, I guess that's uh, what with, I mean by defensive. <laughs> I, I'm thinking about that instance where you're describing the guys that were just weaving and the zeros couldn't do anything to engage them, and the uh, you know the, the wildcats are able to just like get out of the AO altogether. Well, uh, yeah, well, and exactly they they had the advantage there because the zeros had been launched at the limits of their fuel um, from a bull, and so the problem was flying all the way up there for, from a bull. They knew some of the zeros were going to have to divert to another base. Some of them were going to make it back, but Literally, they knew they would not have a lot of gas to fight. So the Wildcats that are that are literally flying for Santa Cruz off the, the carriers or for Guadalcanal from Henderson Field, they have the fuel advantage. They just have to weave long enough for the Zeros to run out of gas. Um, and that's, in fact, that alone is is one of the greatest things that, that has been moved forward into modern tactics is the 
run the bad guy out of bullets and gas. Uh, and <laughs> that's probably the modern implementation of the weed. But anyway, so and let's... And that other account, it, it sounded definitely like it got offensive because like the guy I was talking about, he, he had to dive away because every time... Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that, that there's a little bit that we lose in those accounts as to how offensive was it or was it that Nakajima just said, I've had enough. This guy keeps shooting at me and I, and I don't want to get shot down here so far away. I don't want to run out of gas. I, you know, all the bad things that can happen, it's better to just disengage at this point rather than, than keep picking a fight with these, these wildcats. Well, I don't know, man. So. Is, it, is it really that good? I mean, so I, I have a question here that I just thought of, and I had never thought of this before. So every time I see anything represented about the thatch weave, whether it be a Wikipedia diagram or the red and blue, like streamers and dog fights, they're always basically doing it on like a singular plane, like in the horizontal plane where the aircraft are weaving across each other. What right. is going on in the vertical component of this while this is happening? So that depended on the pilot. Thatch was obviously well ahead of his contemporaries, and he thought more in three dimensions. And so Jimmy Thatch would cut in and and below his wingman doing a thatch weave, so he could then approach the zero from the underside, where it was both most more vulnerable and could not see him as well. Uh, so generally, the thatch weave was thought of as a, as a level kind of maneuver, but when you add a vertical component to it, then it makes it that much harder on the zero and generally that much more surprising. Um, one of the things that you, you don't see a lot in World War II, especially uh, early Pacific, is there's not a lot of vertical maneuvers out of the fighters because when there are, they die. Um, especially the wildcat. The zero has such a great climb rate that if a wildcat tries to go loop with a zero, the zero goes, okay, whatever, we'll do the first one. Then you're going to be out of energy and out of schlitz. And I'm just going to roll back in behind you for the second one. You're going to fall off at the top of your loop because you're out of airspeed. And I'm going to gun you all the way down to the deck. And Sakai actually did that uh, to to one pilot um, that he talks about that. He he literally knew, sure, the guy could do a loop the first time, but the zero was going to outperform him over time. Um, so you don't, you don't see a lot of vertical uh, in World War II. In later times, you absolutely do. You see the the concept of the weave taken into three dimensions, and then that really adds an element of being able to both make life difficult on the attacking aircraft and open up a shot opportunity for the defensive aircraft. So in three dimensions, then, does it kind of become almost like two kind of like interlocking yo-yos going on? Exactly. So, so if you thought about it that way, you almost one aircraft is doing almost a high yo-yo. The other one is almost doing a low yo-yo. And what that allows you to do is you're taking the good bit of both of them. So, uh, and once again, this is kind of tough to talk about on a podcast, uh, cause I'm using my hands right now. But if, if one aircraft is pitching up and slowing down while the other one is cutting across the bottom of the circle, you are creating in a sense, what thatch envisioned as the bait and the hook. So that one aircraft is making themselves a cooperative, but still difficult to shoot target for the enemy. So the other aircraft can come in at a high energy state unobserved and make an attack on that bandit. Does it always work out that way? No, it doesn't. Um, but, but if you, if you add that vertical component, it certainly does help. That's where the, those head on shots from a lower quarter came from. Right, exactly. So, so picking out the area where the zero couldn't see you, uh, and they knew they could make a head on shot there and feel like they were probably not threatened. All right, well, let's talk about uh, some of the detractors, because I, I, th I think that's something that we cannot minimize. We, we have to be honest about it, is that not everybody thought the thatch weave was great. Uh, and in fact, some of the people who were detractors are voices we have to listen to. They're, they're not people that we should discount. Um, so one of the biggest detractors was a pilot who made a name for himself, uh, both in earlier actions and especially at the Battle of Santa Cruz, uh, you may or may not have heard about him. He he was an ace in a day, shot down seven enemy aircraft uh, in the uh, battle in the Battle of Santa Cruz Islands. Uh, Stan Swede Vitasa. Uh, he was a transition pilot. He had flown Dauntlesses early on, got a Navy Cross for his actions in the Dauntless, then transitioned two fighters into flying Wildcats and won yet another Navy Cross for his shooting down seven bandits. I will jokingly say and go, oh well, it was two dive bombers and five torpedo bombers, he still shot down seven enemy aircraft <laughs> in the middle of a big fight. 
in the uh, Battle of Santa Cruz Island. So he is someone we should listen to. But you you also have to understand what he said and what his personality was to to take what he says and to put it in the correct historical context. Because he flew in VF-10 under uh, Lieutenant Commander James Flatley, who had obviously learned the weave from Thatch. Um, and he ends up, you know, shooting down a number of aircraft in that battle. But his takeaway from it all was he said, you know, the, the Thatch weave is useless against an experienced enemy, um, and I'll prove it to you. And so he goes out and flies his four ship as aggressors against a four ship from Lieutenant Commander Flatley, and every time the aggressors win, they beat the snot out of the defenders, and the defenders are doing the Thatch weave. Now, that's a moment where people kind of step back and go, well, see, I, I, we proved that the weave doesn't work. Well, I, I'd ask you to, to balance the two accounts. You've got Sakai and Nakajima saying the weave worked, and you've got Vitasa, you got Swede, demonstrating it didn't. So so where's the truth in between those two guys? How do how do we get through that? Yeah, I don't know. I think, you know, your football analogy is great, right? If you're playing a team and they know what play's coming, it's probably pretty easy yeah. to defeat it, right? Yeah. So so there's no tactic that is undefeatable. Uh, there's always an experienced enemy is always going to be very difficult. And that's one of the things, unfortunately, we learned the hard way over several conflicts in the U.S. military. But that's why we started introducing aggressor and adversary programs is that if you don't take somebody to a point where you show them what an experienced enemy can do, you're going to assume your tactics work all the time. But just because an experienced enemy can chip away at your tactic or someone who has flown against the thatch weave a couple hundred times knows how to shoot you down doesn't mean that that zero pilot who's encountering the weave for the third or fourth or fifth time is going to know what to do. And in fact, he's probably only going to figure it out by seeing some of his buddies shot down. So I think it's something you have to guard against. And, you know, but like I said, there's, there's several accounts of the weave failing. I mean, there's accounts where, you know, fighters did the weave and everybody got shot down. That does not invalidate the tactic. There's, there's a lot of reasons tactics can fail. Uh, it might not, they might not have executed the weave properly. They might have pulled too hard and bled down too much of their speed. Uh, or like, kind of like we talked about with the 3D uh, development, maybe they always pulled level at each other. And so the Zero always saw the wingman coming. And the Zero just pitched up and got away and waited for just the right amount of time for the for the uh, first defender to reverse and rolled in and gunned him. You know, there's there's always reasons why an experienced enemy or an inexperienced executor of a tactic will cause it to fail. That doesn't mean that the core concept of the tactic is a failure. So that's one of the things I think we have to take with a grain of salt is that there absolutely are people who are alive because they did the weave. There are absolutely pilots whose attacks were defeated because they did the weave. The weave was not a wonder weapon. So that kind of needs to lead on into our thinking about how it fits into Blood Red Skies because we can't have an OP tactic or card or uh, ability that that suddenly saves you every time because the weave didn't save us every time. Dude, I got to tell you, I think we already do have a card like that that I use quite a bit. Yeah, <laughs> we'll get to that in a second. So so there's there's a couple questions that people have asked um, that are good historical questions, I think, that, that we need to address before we kick over to the how do we weave in Blood Red Skies. So, Brett, you alluded to it earlier. You're like, well, did they keep doing the weave? Is, is it still a, a credible tactic? Uh, absolutely. Now, once again, you got to dig between anecdotes and you got to take some things with a grain of salt. Uh, there's accounts of A1 Sky Raiders in Vietnam, quote, doing the thatch weave when engaged by MiG-17s. Um, I'm going to be honest. I've read the accounts of all three encounters between uh, U.S. Navy A1 Sky Raiders and MiG-17s. I don't get a thatch weave out of any one of them. I get a lot of aircraft doing defensive brake turns, a lot of aircraft, you know, taking advantage of the fact that they as a prop plane uh, had a much smaller turn radius than the jet that was attacking them. I don't see a pure thatch weave as as we call it. But that goes to my point that what we think of as the thatch weave is really one of the foundational concepts of engaged maneuvering with multiple elements. One guy try to stay alive. The other guy come shoot the bandit off of you. 
<laughs> and failing that, as the Corsairs did at one point, or the, the Skyriders did at one point, run the, the bad guy out of bullets and gas and he'll go home. Uh, now, what we did see is later on, the U.S. Navy F-4s did execute something similar to a thatch weave when they would fly what was known as a fluid four formation. So there's been much argument and discussion about what kind of formation you really want to be best in to to provide good visibility. Um, generally, people who offer their opinions and have never sat in a bubble canopy aircraft cockpit or in the cockpit of a warbird when it's flying, uh, generally those inputs should be discounted um, because visibility in an aircraft is a very difficult thing, even with a canopy like an F-86s or like a MiG-15s. Um, the Brits thought that a staggered formation was the best way uh, to maintain visibility because then the wingman could always clear the lead six. The problem is clearing the wingman six, and that's why the wingman got savaged. That tactic failed. So what did the rest of the world do? They went to what later on became called the combat spread. They realized flying a beam was the best way for both pilots to clear both pilots six o'clock, and that four aircraft doing that, even in something as big as a wall, that was super offensive. Then everybody could clear everybody six o'clock. It was hard to sneak in there. Uh, what did the Navy do? Well, they still paired up people in, in, in section pairs, two ship pairs, and then had the two uh, four ships abeam each other. So everyone was clearing everyone else's six. And if they got jumped, the, the, the act was drag the bandit into the other section of fighters. So it was kind of like a weave, more like what we call the beam defense, um, but very much a principle of, I'm going to use the fact that the bandit's trying to kill me against him so that my buddy over there can make an unobserved entry and shoot the bandit. Uh, today, what do we do is, is we use this maneuver a lot for multiplane engaged maneuvering. We will use it both as a, as a weave kind of maneuver and as a reaction to being bounced by a single or two bandits. And, and generally you train to it when a single bandit bounces you. And so you, you do this break into each other and see who the bandit picks. And then the other guy tries to kill the bandit while the other one tries to stay alive. <laughs> but that kind of brings up one of the other questions. I know, uh, Brett, we'd talked about, you know, when do you weave? How do you weave? Right. That was kind of your question. Yeah. I think I got kind of interested in figuring out a way maybe to use existing mechanics to try to represent this on the table. And I know a lot of other folks have put a lot of thought into it. I'm not claiming to have a perfect solution or that mine's any better than anybody else's, but maybe if this is the right time, maybe we could talk about that. Well, and, and I think there's a lead into that is that was the weave, you know, as, as Roger said, was it initiated once an element was attacked or was it a standard flight maneuver you just did whenever you're in a combat zone? Oh, oh, you um, mean like an actual practice? In, yeah, in yeah, flight. yeah, yeah. Yeah, his, you know, he had, he had asked, you know, you know, the advantage of being able to check each other's blind areas require the weave to be maintained continuously. Um, and that's uh, slightly true and also slightly not true. Um, the, the fact is, yes, the best way to clear your six o'clock is to fly right past your wingman. So, so a, in a sense, a preemptive weave, uh, something we even do today in certain threat levels, is the kind of maneuver that would definitely allow you to be able to check your, your six o'clock. So you'd have whole but the problem is, of aircraft weaving on their way to oh, the yeah. destination. Yeah. But the problem is that takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of time that, um, you know, it, <laughs> it, it, you're going to get tired of weaving. And so you're not going to pay as much attention as you should. You know, it's, it's, it has its downsides. Uh, so what I will say is generally the way Thatch envisioned it was a reactive maneuver. His way of looking at it was that when you saw a zero turning in on you and diving on you and, and coming in to attack you or your wingman, you would do the weave. So if you saw a zero rolling in behind your wingman, you would turn into your wingman. And your wingman was also scanning between you know, you and outside and everything else. He go, Oh, my flight lead just turned into me. I must be getting chased. <laughs> and he would, and you, he would turn into you and it would start the weave and it would give you a chance to shoot the, the zero off his tail. Um, but you know, even in the Vietnam war time frame, the weave was done entering at low altitude to both throw off any aircraft gunners and to throw off any attacking MIGs. So as soon as they would go feet dry, they would start this tactical weave uh, it was also done in Desert Storm. 
in an effort to make life difficult on people shooting at you, whether from the air or from the ground. So, um, but yeah, that does lead directly into how do we do it in the game? And I don't know, you know, uh, you guys are, are, are kind of of differing opinions. Uh, Steve, what was, what's been kind of your thought about implementing the thatch weave in blood red skies? Dude, I have been saying for probably the better part of a year now that the defensive tactics card is one of the most offensive cards that you can use because if it, you're not a moron, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that to me, you know, I've said that to a bunch of people and they kind of like don't get where I'm coming from and then when you play somebody in with a single trait aircraft that has that tight turn bonus and you are totally in the driver's seat to well, take, I'll tell you the tight turn uh, bonus I mean, is awesome. But, but think about being the poor wildcat who's single trait with robust. Yeah. I mean, but being <laughs> so, able yeah. to be in the driver's seat and you could say, okay, I'm going to use this card defensive and I'm going to turn it into a deflection shot or I can use it and I can unpredictably turn this, same engagement now into a head on shot where I'm getting to shoot back. And depending on what the current boom shit score is and the pilot level and all that stuff, I mean, the defensive tactics card to me, legitimately, with the utility you could use it as and the offensive and defensive way you can employ it is basically the thatch weave. Yeah, I would agree. It is the single most like frustrating thing that. Steve can do to me when we play our games. You know, the only challenge though in this context is, you know, it requires in current gameplay, uh, you single turn a uh, single trait aircraft with tight turn to pull. Well, off, I right. Think, with- well, I, I think you can pull it off without tight turn, but I think you have to know what you're doing. And so these are the caveats that I put to using defensive tactics as the correct substitute for the thatch weave is the first thing is you're not going to defeat the tailing. That that bandit is going to get in there and they're going to tail you. And generally, I always couch this in a scenario like, uh, like bounced. So the enemy starts 18 inches away behind you and dives in. And so they show up as neutral and you start the game as neutral as well. But they show up as neutral behind you and tailing you. So even when you play defensive tactics at that point, he's at just at six inches, has a valid shot, and he drops you to disadvantage. And if you're a wildcat, you only get to turn 45 degrees. But that's that's okay, because you're going to turn 45 degrees and make it a deflection shot. Um, but the the problem is that guy is still probably has a pretty decent chance of getting shot down. Um, thankfully, at least it's a deflection shot, more dodge dice. <laughs> the, the poor wildcat isn't flying that fast anyway. Um, so it's it's not a whole lot of odds in his favor. Uh, the, the real problem to me comes from how does the wingman threaten you? Because the wingman is also neutral. So if he burns advantage and climbs back up, he's neutral at the end of, of that turn. He's not, he's not able to, um, be in a position to employ a weapon. And if he only turns while he's neutral, he's only going to get a standard move in a 45 degree turn. And then he's still neutral and climbs up and now he's advantaged. And maybe the next turn he can shoot, but he's not turning directly into threaten that fighter. So I think there's some limitations there. Um, But I think it does satisfy the overall theme that said, I'm going to do something when you think you have me easy to shoot down and I'm going to make it more difficult for you. You guys kind of agree with that? Yeah, I do. When I first started thinking about it, the the two existing mechanics that immediately came to mind were six cents from the a skills and defensive tactics so some combination of those mechanics perhaps between the two ships being attacked maybe have some relevance well and i know you and roger both talked about a a doctrine card that would really define something that physically on the table kind of looks like uh, the results of a thatch weave. Maybe not everybody was moving exactly like a thatch weave, but the the results of where the the bad guys ended up was a lot like a thatch weave. What what were some of those ideas that you guys had? Yeah, my initial idea was to um, you know have some kind of play that um, required a, a tailed aircraft to have a friendly aircraft within six inches. If that was the case, you could maybe turn off that tail, akin to uh, six cents 
the A scale where it just it's not uh, right aircraft's right. not tailed and you don't lose advantage. But then to also impart some bonus turn to the friendly aircraft within six inches. And the, my initial thought was, you know, maybe give a bonus ninety degree turn at at that point to the to the let's call it wingman, but limiting that turn towards the uh, pursuing aircraft. Uh, you know, the thought there was, and I'm not like. I'm not sure how I feel about it, but that maybe that would impart some offensive potential in a subsequent activation, right? Well, I, I think it would, and I and I think there's that's much like the thought process with defensive tactics that if you just opt to not burn any of your advantage, fly forward, turn, and climb up to now be advantaged, that that kind of gets you to a similar thought because I think a lot of people keep forgetting that the aircraft that would be weaving. They certainly aren't disadvantaged because if you're disadvantaged, dude, you're you're inside of what the weave can save. <laughs> you're going to get shot. If you're neutral, that's probably a good description because the bandit hasn't bounced you yet. But if you're advantaged, you don't need a weave. You you either have enough airspeed or altitude or something over the bandit that you can trade to make a maneuver that will defeat his shot. And I guess that's why. I always remind people, this is the kind of thing that is uh, a, you know, a neutral aircraft with a band at their six o'clock. And, and you kind of have, you're, you're taking the maneuvers of three aircraft. You've got the attacking aircraft, the, the, the attacky, <laughs> the defender, and the defender's wingman, you know. So, so I think there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of things you got to kind of roll into that, that one card. You know, the other thing that I want to jump in with the use of defensive tactics is sometimes I'll use it like on a plane that's already activated that turn, right? Is now getting shot at. I don't necessarily even want to turn it into a, a deflection. I don't necessarily want to turn it into a head on. I'm just using it to change the position enough to kind of get an extra turn leading into the next activation. So like that whole idea of kind of stacking turns onto degrees of turns onto other degrees of turns in the following activation is something that kind of comes into play there too. Well, and I think that's an important thing to remember is that if you're, if you're going to talk about quote, simulating the thatch weave, this is not a one turn action. This is something that you need to play out a couple different situations over two minimum, uh, probably three turns to see how it, it interacts and don't just do it with a single bandit. It You, you got to figure out how it works with two bandits back there because this is a constraint of the game. I mean, yes, the weave was really designed against a single bandit bouncing two fighters. We know in the game the minimum element size is two and that especially in bounced, you're going to have two bandits show up 18 inches away from you, advantaged generally, and they're going to make your life very difficult. Um, so... I think if you play it out, if you if you don't just take a mental snapshot about what's what happens at the end of that that playing of the card, but how does the rest of the quote weave play out? I think then you get to the the point where you say defensive tactics work some of the time. Certainly doesn't work all the time, but it it sets me up to make smart choices. Because the thing I didn't talk about is what happens if the bandit shows up outside of where your section is. So you have your two fighters and rather than being between you, he is, let's say to the right of one of them. If that guy turns 45 degrees towards his wingman, the bandit is still directly at his six o'clock almost there. You have to actually execute. You're setting up this follow on maneuvering. Like you're talking about, you set up, you do defensive tactics to turn into the bandit and to get your six o'clock away from him. But you know that the very next turn, you're going to turn back the other direction to take the fight back towards your wingman because your wingman is going to try to rendezvous on the bandit. Um, so there's there's a lot of different follow-on pieces to this that aren't just um, just aren't kind of tied up nicely at the end of, end of playing a card. Yeah, that was but, the thing that I liked about the potential for a bonus turn for that wingman. I thought it just gave you some opportunity to maybe do future well, stuff. Well, I think that, it does, and I yeah. and I think it even preemptively does some cool things because we had talked about. It. I don't think it's the right answer in the card, but. Wouldn't it be cool that you play this when, whenever an aircraft moves to a tailing position and then all of a sudden it allows you to move your wingman 
turn him 90 degrees towards that tailing bandit, which then with the wingman effect would defeat the tailing. And so you've, you've kind of, in a sense, done, done what you need. And if the bandit is advantaged and you're neutral, you know, you probably deserve to get shot. <laughs> no, but you know, it's, it's one of those situations that kind of is covered by poor Thatch's wingman getting shot down. It's a, it's a shot you couldn't deny anyway. But what you've done is you've taken away the ability of that bandit to get in the sweet spot and tell you because now this other aircraft is pointing at him and using the wingman effect. Yeah, that was so. kind of my initial run at it. And, uh, you know, all this was with the uh, the constraint of passing a maneuver test to make it work, you know, to kind of copy an existing mechanics. I bounced this off of Roger and um, he had a suggestion kind of similar, but in reaction to that uh, tailing, that uh, passing the maneuver test would then um, make a... Uh, you know, make the the uh, the target of the pursuit not tailed, and then would give the wingman within six inches a wingman effect without right. moving him. So without would, turning him, yeah, exactly. Because yeah. that's that's a great thing where you say it's the it's you can't physically move the airplanes like a thatch weave. And and Roger said this to me a couple times when we've talked about tactics or maneuvers or stuff. He's like, you just can't physically move the airplanes in blood red skies to the point in space they would be and you shouldn't have to because it's generalized yeah i thought so that was here a, what, i thought that was pretty elegant and i thought it, yeah like it you was said, it, it uh it, it um used that compression we talk about all the time to make yeah that work. It, it does it basically says you know what they're quote doing a weave out there but by playing this card now your target is not tailed because that allows the other aircraft if he's within six inches to declare his wingman effect out of any other arc. And, and that, I think that also then it, it's a quick solution to the initial shot and it sets up where the weave really was, was useful in that if you, if you think about the order of how this all happens, the attacker is obviously moving first because he's advantaged. The other aircraft would then take their maneuvers and he has to decide, does he follow that aircraft does he follow the, his original target because he is then going to open himself up to an attack um, by that other aircraft who has now climbed up from neutral and is is at an advantage position you know or is he going to basically peel off the attack and try to do something else or is he, is he going to play the the no stalling card and try to turn inside you know who knows there's, there's a lot of different things he can do but it still puts him on the horns of a dilemma as we used to always say and War fighting 101 in the Marine Corps. You you make the enemy make a choice. Sure, you can continue the attack, but I'm going to get a shot on you for doing it. You know, it, it's been said a lot of times, that, and, and it can't be forgotten, that blood red skies, all of this stuff is an abstraction, right? So, like, there's no Absolutely. yo-yos. There's no split <laughs> S's. There's none of that stuff, right? Yes. So, like, when the outmaneuver, if I outmaneuver you, that's basically, like, you decided to do a split S. I decided to kind of, like, yo-yo over the, or, you know, whatever. That's, like, that whole abstraction of that whole thing oh, yeah. happening. Oh, yeah. So is it as simple as, you know, if I get into a position where I can shoot you. Right. And you have a friendly plane within nine inches of me i can force you into a maneuver test to have to take the shot and that's kind of like okay we abstractly did the the thatch weave you defeated the thatch weave and you succeeded on the maneuver test or the thatch weave you know beat you and you didn't succeed on the maneuver test and that was the whole abstraction of the thatch thatch weave happening yeah and, and the way i looked at it was slightly modified from from your suggestion was instead of making you take a maneuver test it was simply an out maneuver i i got a free out maneuver attempt and so i played the thatch weave and if i had a wingman within six inches that wingman then could make an out maneuver attempt so generally his his skill probably was less than yours so he'd have to roll on his own ability but the the trick was what that would do is that could take a neutral exactly. fighter out of the ability to shoot that guy. And so all of a sudden he's disadvantaged. Yeah, that's, that's the abstraction. Or it might even take an advantage fighter who didn't have to dive there. He just ended up behind. You start the weave. It takes an advantage fighter and now makes him neutral. So now he suddenly has a decision. He's like, oh, crap, I'm neutral. Yes, I just tailed this guy. Um, but 
but now do I shoot him? I still have a valid chance to kill him, but I've lost a level of advantage. So his buddy who had the free outmaneuver attempt, next turn he can turn into me and outmaneuver me again, or he can turn into me, climb up, and then he's shooting me the next turn. You know, there's there's a lot of different considerations there. Yeah, I and actually I, that's what I, I think we really want. Really yeah. like that because that takes into the whole thematic uh, nature of those those maneuver checks and maneuver tests are basically in your mind. You can conceptualize that as doing whatever maneuver oh, yeah. you thematically oh, want it to be. Right. Well, we've talked about it with the vowel, and so the the question is. You know, a unladen Val or Kate, how the heck can they, quote, outmaneuver a fighter? Well, it isn't that they're doing the vertical rolling scissors and all these other things and getting at a point where they can shoot that fighter. It's not at all. But what it is, is we rationalize it as that's them breaking hard in and jamming the shot the fighter had. So the fighter loses a level of advantage in, a, in that sense. Um, and because he's trying to shoot down this bomber, he's now more vulnerable to all the other enemy fighters that are out there. I like what you suggested with that, Steve, because it, it opens up that it's not all resolved in that, re, in that single reaction, that you've got to then capitalize on that shift in advantage to make something happen in subsequent activations. I like that. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that, that we all like about Blood Red Skies. It's not check your six. You're not determining exactly your point in space. It's not as bad as Birds of Prey. Oh my God, that game just makes my head hurt looking at the rules. It's not one of those where I'm determining attitude and airspeed and dive angle and all those things. You're literally saying we're roughly putting six of these airplanes against six of those and the smart tactical choices you make will determine the winner, not who understands the most about how to perform the airplane uh, within the uh, the performance characteristics because that's no fun to me. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Anything else about how we do the weave in Blood Red Skies? I like it, man. I think there's, I think actually kind of as everything with Blood Red Skies, right? Simpler is probably going to wind up better when you get, when you oh, get yeah. to the point oh, where yeah. you can't squeeze the wording on one of those mini cards, it's probably yeah, the it's wrong probably wording too, for this game. It, it is. Right? Well, and, and I leave also, I'll leave everyone with, with Roger's comment. This is your game. So we've also got to guard against telling people, no, you can't do that, or no, you shouldn't make that card, or no, you shouldn't do whatever. Try it. Experiment with it. If your local gaming club is doing a bunch of Midway stuff and you're like, we want to try a Thatch Weave card, take your hand at it. You know, I, a little inside baseball, uh, when we were all talking about it, I turned back to Brett and I'm like, write the card. Just tell me what you want it to say, because we can debate you know, till, till we're blue in the face, what, what ACE tactic it should be, ba or ACE skill it should be based on, or, or anything like that, just write the rule and try it. And then as Brett and I talked through it, we're like, ah, here's some problems, here's some, here's some caveats, and here's some better language, and that's okay. I mean, gamers want to tinker with their game. I mean, since the first War Games came out, they've tweaked the rules. That's okay. We, I don't think we should ever get to a point where we're like, man, you can't change the rules. Not every game is a tournament game. A lot of games are club or, or friendly uh, narrative games. So that's once again me on my soapbox. But I spent most of tonight on my soapbox. <laughs> Anything else, guys? I guess not. All right. Well, here's the deal. Let me, let me summarize this. So I've been really confrontational at the beginning and partway throughout this. This is, you know, it's not an attempt to, to really poke somebody in the eye. It's an attempt for us collectively to look at how we do business. Uh, and I really believe that the, the truth of how we game has to start in the historical accounts. And then we can theorize and we can do whatever we want after that. But, you know, let's, let's start with what we know happened and let's build a game that's fun for everybody. And let's let people experiment and try things and, and have the freedom to build a game that they want to play. Because once again, if we want to build Air War or Fox Bat and Phantom again, uh, those games are no fun. Rick Tovin's War, nobody plays those anymore. And so that alone should be reason why we don't want to do that. Anyway, Steve, Brett, thanks guys. I really appreciate you coming on tonight uh, and taking the time to let me have my monologue and then for us to talk about all this. 
Yeah, and if anybody wants to uh, find out about the real Thatch Weave, you can email Jello at fighterpilotpodcast.com, <laughs> and he'll tell you what actually happened. Because so he's be a good. top gun instructor. I <laughs> I was only a lowly Marine Aviation Weapons and Tactics Squadron 1 instructor. We're not the same as Top Gun. We don't play volleyball with our shirts off. We actually fly aerial missions. Sorry. Anyway, too soon. <laughs> All right, thanks, Brett. Appreciate you being on the podcast as well. Any last thoughts? No, just happy to be here. It was fun, you know, kind of kicking kicking the ideas around. I, I really enjoyed the you know kind of the back, uh, you know, behind the scenes discussion we had before recording about you know the different mechanics that might come into play. And I know a lot Absolutely. of other people are you know kind of chiming in on that kind of that kind of vibe on radio. Yeah. <laughs> well, so that's the thing. So if you think we are full of shit, let us know. Absolutely, go out there, comment on the individual post that that has this shared and says you know this is what you guys thought about that if you don't know what you're talking about and here's the 17 historical sources that disprove you and i'll be happy because i love that kind of a discussion i love digging into history i love learning about it and i think that's the way most of us that play this game are so please go out comment like us on facebook uh you know give us reviews on itunes uh google podcast whatever podcast service you go through um, make sure you uh, you get that information out there to us because then we can shape the next tactics discussion to be about something you want to talk about, not about the thatch weave. But thank you very much for listening. We will talk to you all later. Dude, you know what's like funny about this whole thing is like when you play a video game or you watch like a movie and you see like a dog fight it's like you put the target on the thing you pull the trigger and you like hit it every time yeah like <laughs> controlling an airplane does not work like that like it is not just like like it's i i always laugh about that that you know you see these dog fights in the movies with like three zeros chasing one dude and sakai's literally like look fuckers Join up on my wing and shut the fuck up. <laughs> Let me shoot them down. Because <laughs> you, cause you get in the way, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because you, you're just gonna all the they're just gonna get in the way of, of you know your lead trying to kill people. There's been times where I've like been putting along at like 90 knots, and I'm like, how the fuck do you point your plane straight enough at something <laughs> else that's fucking flying and hit it with a gun? Like, yeah, yeah. It like I I the until you actually like have a plane in the air and you're controlling it it's like so hard to comprehend how it actually moves that the movies just like can't you, you know, just can't you can't, can't do explain. in the movies it's hard it, to do. once you get through some of the history of it can i say something like um, but was it really that good i mean that kind of a myth i mean it seems like oh god <laughs> i appreciate all this information but i'm definitely gonna have to send jello a listener email and <laughs> <verify> <laughs> that. please please do because he'll 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 read your chapter <laughs> I'll read your chapter out of the Top Gun manual that I'm sure he wrote. Oh, wait, no, I don't think he did.